Right. Anyway, I am finding today especially <laughs> joyous because I need Africa desperately. And in three weeks, I was supposed to leave for Botswana, and obviously uh -huh. I'm not. I know, it's so uh... I was thrilled when Jayesh said that he would do his elephant material because for a birthday three years ago, he gave me that glorious book, which I treasure. And, you know, I open it regularly. He and his son captured something elemental. And it's also fun when you've got a more than world-class doctor who has <laughs> such an aesthetic sense and is a friend. So Thank you, you're too kind. <laughs> Jayish, please. Okay, I'm gonna get started and share. Don't forget screen. to record. Oh, yeah, recording. Yes, it's, it's, it's recording. So share screen, uh, elephant presentation, share. Okay. Uh, oh, see waiting room. There's more people. Oh, admit all. Okay. Anu and should we take another picture? Anu and Penelope have just. Wait, I think we can do. It. Shall we do it at the end? Shall we, shall we take another? The people might leave. Uh, okay. So um, uh, these are pictures taken uh, over a few years. Uh, number of trips to uh, Botswana, Kenya, and Tanzania. And uh, uh, mine are from Botswana and Kenya, and Tibu's are from Botswana, Kenya, and Tanzania. And I'm going to give you a little story about the pictures and the people involved, and sometimes just flip through some of the pictures. Uh, sometimes I just butt in. <laughs> if she thinks I'm uh, talking too much. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this shows you uh, the endangered species. Uh, uh, list and uh, African elephants are considered endangered, uh, but in the vulnerable category, uh, the slide shows you how uh, these animals are characterized. We need to get full screen. Switch, switch to slideshow at the bottom of your presentation if you can. Uh, you because have, we're, we're, only, we're seeing your whole screen with little <laughs> thumbnails. Uh, let me see. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um. Select the first slide. Click on your, yeah, click on your first slide and then you can just move forward. Yeah. Over more. Where does he? Uh, what are you let seeing? Me, let me try. Jayesh, we're seeing all of That's the That's not working. So what, what are you seeing? We're seeing all of the pictures. We're seeing, We're all. seeing thumbnails. We're oh, seeing th all your yeah. thumbnails. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. You have to go at one ah. at a time. Oh, no, no. I know. Uh, uh, okay. I, I know exactly what the problem was. I, I, will, uh, I will fix that right now. Uh, elephant presentation. Here we are. And that That's is the part. screen I need to share. Okay. Okay, right now I'm saying gallery. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm going to change the... Okay. I don't have your screen. I have all of us. Yeah. Share screen. Ah, and this I should have work. the top of Penelope's head. There okay, we go. Uh, yeah. Perfect. You good? You got it. Okay, perfect. So, uh, Botswana, Kenya, and Tanzania. And... As uh, this slide shows, uh, elephants are on the endangered uh, species uh, list. Uh, not quite uh, critically endangered, but when you look at uh, this particular slide, you can see that between 2006 and 2015, there was an 18% decline in the elephant population. Wow. It's not going to be long before things become uh, very, very difficult. and and. Uh, as I'm sure uh, a number of you have seen and, and, and Barbara and I have discussed, there is this mystery illness that seems to have afflicted uh, elephants in Botswana over the last few months. And about 300 of them have died under very mysterious circumstances. Uh, 
it could be some new uh, disease new pathogen uh, we don't know yet but uh, the uh, more definitive tests are expected next week they have uh, one set of results from uh, zimbabwe <laughs> and the other set of results uh, from south africa is still uh, awaited uh, so this uh, um, uh, picture of africa the map shows you uh, the range of the african elephant uh, the dark green is uh, the known ranges actually it's surprising how limited the range is and the light green is possible and the dotted is um, uh, is uh, <coughs> loud so we all mute yeah uh, this shows you a map of uh, botswana uh, you know which barbara has been to many many times and uh, the okavango delta the fertile area of the okavango delta which is where the problem with the elephants has been seen and the chobi national park uh, near the linyanti river are the main uh, elephant areas and botswana is home to uh, 130000 elephants which is a third of the uh, elephant population in the world uh, uh, knowing keeping the elephants safe there is obviously uh, uh, incredibly important uh, uh, to the survival of elephants uh, unfortunately the new president of botswana after uh, ian kama um, left has opened up uh, hunting including hunting of elephants in uh, selected areas which is not a uh, step in the right direction at all in fact has reversed a number of the good things that had been done uh, the this shows you uh, east africa kenya and tanzania Uh, and although the Ser Mara, Serengeti, and Gorongoro ecosystem is uh, important for uh, predators and the migration, elephants are concentrated in other areas. And I'm going to be talking about uh, the Amboseli, Chulu Hills, and the Savo uh, ecosystem, focusing mainly on uh, on Amboseli, uh, where uh, there is a um, very well known uh, population of elephants um, so this shows you uh, what the landscape is like in the okavango delta area uh, forest but with uh, a river and marshes and uh, we drive in open vehicles uh, sometimes these crossings are very dicey and pictures are taken uh, uh, sitting in the vehicle uh, uh, like this and that's uh, that's ibu aran our son and that's me there um and this picture was obviously taken by me uh oh. yes uh, and then it's a uh, unique because it has got a horizontal horizon <laughs> a level horizon despite siva having <laughs> taken it <laughs> so this uh, uh, when you take the puddle jumper uh, single engine uh, six seater aircraft from maun Uh, to uh, to the Bokavango Delta, one of the camps, you can often see these little groups of elephants uh, walking. You can see these three elephants uh, uh, up from the uh, from the plane. One interesting thing that one sees in uh, Botswana, which you know, elephants uh, get into the water everywhere, but to the extent it is done in Botswana. is uh, really quite remarkable uh, they they swim and uh, they go into the water uh, to a much greater extent uh, and often submerge completely or nearly completely uh, when they do that uh, this uh, shows you a little chain of elephants uh, crossing uh, the dumatau lagoon dumatau is a roar of the lion um, going from one island to uh, another sort of uh, marshy grassy island to get some uh, fresh uh, grass uh, our pontoon boat came a little too close and uh, the elephants got a little panicked uh, and we had to uh, move away really quickly uh. it was very deep and they were actually swimming and holding up a little baby and uh, <clears throat> this shows you a big bull uh, uh, swimming and you can see from the pattern of the uh, water how much of uh, himself he had submerged all they need to do is uh, uh, poke the trunk out and they can breathe uh, and that sometimes makes for very interesting photographs uh, here as you can see 
the water level uh, on uh, on all the elephants. Uh. So this uh, was on uh, my first trip to Botswana. Really quite an extraordinary encounter, uh, where uh, early in the morning we set out uh, from the Sauti camp uh, and uh, heard. Uh, uh, maybe 20 minutes, uh, half an hour from the camp, uh, a lot of commotion and uh, distress, cries of elephants and uh, hyenas. And the first thing we saw was this hyena, and you can see a little blood, uh, dried blood around the neck. And then we see uh, uh, this elephant, uh, um, it's a female, uh, trying to uh, uh, drive off something, looking at... Uh, uh, us or something in our direction uh, with uh, uh, some panic and aggression. And basically what we found was that there was a confrontation between a group of elephants and hyenas. And it still wasn't clear what exactly was going on until we saw that the elephant group had this uh, tiny baby that was effectively newborn, probably two or three days old. And the hyenas were trying to get uh, at the baby. The elephants were uh, uh, spewing dust uh, in the air to try and uh, um, hide themselves in the Mopani, that's the bush, and uh, had formed a circle around the baby and were trying to get away. And here you can see uh, a couple of the hyenas, that's, uh, I don't know whether it's a mother or one of the other elephants, uh, but you can see the baby uh, you can see the blood uh, on the rump of the baby and it's uh, lying down. It was obviously exhausted uh, uh, with whatever was going on. Again, a confrontation there. You can see the blood on the uh, face of the hyena, the mouth of the hyena. Trying to, uh, the elephants are trying to run. The baby is uh, also trying to run. Amazingly, uh, the whole chase lasted maybe about uh, three, three and a half hours. And uh, uh, for an hour, after the first hour and a half or two, the uh, hyenas and us lost uh, the elephants completely. So we stayed with the hyenas at a, a reasonable distance so as not to interfere with things in any way. And uh, uh, an hour later, the, elephant, the hyenas located the elephants again in a, in a clearing. You can see again trying to run, the hyenas are trying to get at the baby, the baby is trying to run. And uh, these, are, these pictures are literally taken uh, maybe a second apart, uh, if that. And there is the mother trying to turn to confront the hyenas and actually ends up tripping the baby. There is the baby falling, uh, the hyenas are trying to get at the baby, trying to catch its rump. And now three or four of the hyenas are on the baby and the mother turns around aggressively and uh, drives the hyenas off. This is uh, uh, dramatic how she kicked out at the hyenas to try and uh, get them away from the baby, uh, sort of driving them off. And uh, they turned and uh, managed to actually escape. So that was my last frame where the uh, hyenas and the elephants uh, are in the same frame. And subsequently the elephants ran off and the hyenas uh, gave up. Uh, you can almost see the defeat uh, and the, you know, they're pretty bloodied. Uh, so at least uh, I think everybody was glad despite, uh, you know, despite biology and the circle of life that the elephants got away. Uh, the trunks and the tusks always make for uh, beautiful patterns. I think this is one of Tibu's pictures. Uh, uh, it's actually remarkable how he and I, when we shoot together, are in the same uh, vehicle with similar equipment. And uh, we have a different perspective on uh, looking at things. Uh, uh, this, one is, uh, this one is mine. That one is uh, Tibu's. And so is that one. Um, and uh, it's uh, amazing how uh, even these thorny bushes are handled with extreme care by the elephants. A uh, uh, few portraits of, oh, uh, very interesting uh, skin pattern with uh, light being caught uh, by the bush. This is, I think, uh, Ibu's picture. Uh, the uh, ear pattern that you see here uh, tends to be uh, quite unique from one elephant to the other. And I'll, I'll come to that uh, 
uh, later. I think this is another one of uh, Tibu's pictures. Uh, so uh, one morning uh, I uh, went with our driver and uh, the guide uh, and uh, we found this uh, old bull uh, who seemed to be in a indifferent temper, but we found a ditch and we drove the vehicle in the ditch so we would be at a lower level. And uh, he sort of wanted to approach closer, but couldn't and was not too happy and tried to sort of uh, kick uh, some dust at us. Um, um, this is an interesting picture because uh, uh, the previous evening, uh, the light was very poor and I had uh, set the camera to uh, manual settings uh, and uh, um, I'd forgotten the next morning when we set out that I had uh, changed the setting on the camera. After years, I'm still not disciplined enough. So good job, I'm a professional photographer. Uh, and, you know that one. Uh, yes, and, and actually uh, the... Um, uh, highly overexposed picture turned out to be very interesting. Uh, nice, nice abstract sort of photograph. Uh, uh, here is, is it's, it's interesting to note that uh, elephants in Botswana often tend to have uh, relatively small tusks. Uh, uh, very early morning photograph, you can see uh, the shadow of the trunk uh, rather nicely with the slanting sun. Beautiful golden orange light. Uh, an Eden-like picture with the birds and uh, I just wish the elephant uh, was facing us but uh, didn't oblige. Uh, little baby there. Another one. Their eyes are really quite uh, amazing. Eyes and the lashes. Uh, and they always have this dried white secretion which might be a uh, uh, mineral coming from their uh, tear ducts. A few uh, more close portraits uh, of uh, the elephants uh, in Botswana. So the, uh, as I said, uh, the Mara, Serengeti and Gorongoro systems are, are uh, very important for wildlife, but uh, not especially uh, uh, great for elephants. This is the Gorongoro crater. And uh, what is interesting in the Gorongoro crater is that most elephants are solitary. And uh, one can often catch a nice picture of a, a solitary bull walking with the crater rim in the background. I think this is one of Timu's uh, pictures. Uh, and uh, these are... Uh, the next three or four pictures are pictures in Masai Mara that I have taken uh, uh, where you often see uh, solitary animals or uh, some groups with the endless uh, uh, Mara plains um, giving uh, nice photo opportunities. Uh, you can see in this picture, there's a little antelope uh, on the horizon also. Uh, you will see throughout the presentation that uh, I'm very partial to uh, to black and white, uh, but there are some pictures that I think come out uh, better in color. And I think this is one of them. Again, in uh, Mara, this is a, a wonderfully cloudy day and I love the clouds. Uh, and the sun suddenly broke through uh, the clouds and uh, gave uh, opportunity for these two uh, very interesting pictures. Uh, This is a uh, very early morning in the Masai Mara as well. Uh, the sun is about to rise. So the um, uh, main elephant area is the Amboseli Chulu Hills uh, Savo ecosystem. Uh, Savo, uh, where the famous man-eating lands came from, has had uh, terrible problems with poaching because it's a it's a public park. Uh, controlled by the government completely, whereas um, uh, Chulu Hills has had much less of a problem because uh, the ecosystem has a Great Plains uh, uh, and National Geographic uh, venture there uh, with a wonderful camp called Old Donio, and they have taken very stringent anti-poaching measures. And the same thing has happened to uh, Amboseli 
because around Amboseli is a uh, Maasai Conservancy uh, where actually we, we've uh, done most of our uh, elephant watching and that uh, provides um, very strong protection against uh, poaching. So this is the Chulu Hills area. You can see these volcanic hills in the background and, uh, and uh, plains uh, uh, with, uh, with nice tree and um, some zebras. And the plains also have a lot of dust storms and that can sometimes make for very atmospheric uh, uh, pictures, one of the hills and, and the storm in the distance. So the Chulu Hills uh, area is very well known for a uh, 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 number of uh, large bulls that are uh, generally solitary or move around in small groups. And um, uh, there are not many herds. So you've got, uh, got a bull here, and uh, this is another bull. Uh, uh, Old Donio is uh, on a hill and it overlooks uh, um, a little uh, a clearing valley like thing where there is a water hole and elephants uh, often uh, come there. Uh, and you can see here that the tusks uh, that these elephants have are much larger than the tusks in uh, Botswana. The problem with uh, Chulu Hills is uh, because of the forest and the bushes, it's difficult to see uh, elephants uh, uh, in the early morning or late evening when the light is favorable. But often the elephants come to uh, drink at the water hole at uh, night. So what uh, we did was went down and uh, uh, hid near the water hole. And when elephants came, this is, com is supposed to be completely dark. In fact, it is completely dark. And uh, I um, uh, uh, gave a, used a long exposure and then used a small uh, pen light sized uh, flashlight to kind of paint the elephants with the light. So you have this ghostly image of the elephants. You can see the stars, you can see the Kilimanjaro range uh, there in the background. And this is one of the Maasai villages uh, in the distance. The, um, on the second day that we were in Oldonio, the uh, manager of the lodge showed me uh, photographs of uh, uh, an elephant called One Ton. Uh, and it's just the most striking looking elephant that I had seen up to that point. So my obsession became to find One Ton. And everybody told me that he is tough to find and you're not going to be able to find uh, One Ton. And on the last evening, we were supposed to have left early the next morning. Uh, the light was sort of starting to fade. Maybe it was I don't know, five o'clock, six o'clock in the evening. And uh, we heard that one ton has been sighted. And we uh, said, let's make a dash for it. So the driver said, okay, hold on. Because uh, otherwise you might get thrown out of the vehicle. And we uh, went breakneck towards the area where he had been sighted. And he, with three other elephants, was near the home of a man called Richard Bonham, who is one of the founders of the Big Life uh, Foundation with uh, Nick Brandt. And he has a home in uh, the Maasai area of uh, Chulu Hill with a because of a special dispensation from the Maasai people. In fact, he's called the White Maasai. And he sort of flies around in this uh, little single engine, uh, engine plane. So we... Um, uh, we went there and we found these elephants uh, near his uh, home. And if you have time at the end, I'll show you a couple of little clips that uh, Seema shot of uh, this. But that is one ton. And you can see these totally incredible tusks. Uh, you can see the asymmetry between the tusks. And uh, that's because elephants tend to be right or left tusked. So one ton is right tusked and therefore the right tusk has uh, been worn down much more than the left one. And so here are a few pictures of, uh, of one ton, really quite a magnificent uh, animal, about 50 years old. And in the clip, when you see him walking, you can really appreciate uh, the tusks even more than you can in the, in the still photographs. Uh, this is the picture on the cover of the elephant book. Uh, I think this is Tibu's picture. Uh, 
guys, it's almost got a look of the last elephant left. Uh, uh, this is an interesting picture. At one point, uh, uh, maybe we got a little too close or he got uh, slightly irritated and uh, uh, shook his head in the disapproval at us, uh, uh, threatening a little bit. And uh, Ibu captured the, this picture. Uh, Barbara, on that particular uh, trip, I was uh, trying to experiment with a medium format uh, Hasselblad uh, oh, camera no. for the first time. And uh, uh, all my pictures were either shaken or uh, uh, half a second after the moment had passed. <laughs> so I, I missed this one, but Tibu nailed it completely. I've never <laughs> learned medium format. No, they, I think the interesting thing with the medium format cameras, uh, the Hasselblad and the new Fujifilm uh, 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 GFX 50 and 100 is that they really have a 35 mm type uh, uh, regular DSLR type uh, format. Uh, but uh, uh, they're too they're heavy really... for me. Sorry. Oh no! You know something? These uh, the the. Uh, the uh, Hasselblad and the Fujifilm are not that heavy. They are certainly heavier than uh, digital SLRs. So no, no, no question about that. But for for us, uh, it was not that much of a difficulty to use it because uh, the the Canons that we use are the uh, 1D series, uh, 1D Mark IV and 1DX, which are very heavy and much larger than the uh, the um, uh, 1D Mark IV type uh, cameras. You use an icon, so I think. Uh, the, the medium format would definitely be heavier. Uh, and I think that is uh, the last picture that we have of uh, one ton. I mean, it's the light had uh, really gone down substantially by then. This is pretty, pretty high ISO probably. But uh, it's, it's, I just love the drama of the picture with the animal, the, uh, the broken uh, uh, bush and the flying bird. Uh, And so on to uh, Amboseli, that is uh, uh, Mount Kilimanjaro uh, at uh, dawn. And uh, you can actually see the graininess because it was uh, quite dark. And um, uh, from across the uh, uh, Amboseli Plains. Kilimanjaro, of course, as I'm sure all of us know, is in uh, Tanzania. And uh, Amboseli is on the Kenya side uh, and provides a perfect backdrop. So the interesting thing with uh, uh, the Amboseli Conservancy, the Maasai area, is that you can actually get out of the vehicle, provided the guide trusts you, and you can go off-road. Uh, well, I guess Sima has to trust the guide. Um, so that's that's me uh, uh, taking a picture uh, in Amboseli. Uh, this is on in our 2017 trip, uh, and uh, this is uh, uh, this is me. Uh, Tibu and our guide uh, Grant Atkinson and I will again if I have time I will show you a little clip of this particular encounter this picture is taken by uh, Seema <laughs> so you have to you 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 can't be fussy about uh, uh, you know lying in uh, or close to uh, elephant dung and on on stones which might uh, which might scratch you uh, or uh, get incredibly dirty and dusty uh, In the conservancy, they have this uh, hill with a very steep gradient. And uh, the best way to uh, uh, look for elephants every morning uh, and, and in the afternoon drive is to uh, drive up the hill and then look around uh, everywhere. These are both uh, panoramic pictures. The first one taken by Seema and the second one uh, taken by me. And it shows you, you can see the plains and the uh, uh, the dried up Lake Amboseli in the distance. Uh, uh, there is uh, Tibu, there is Sima, Tibu there again. And that uh, in the car is uh, Jonah, our driver uh, on the 2017 trip and also on the 2020 trip. Uh, and there is uh, Grant Atkinson, our guide. He's the only person I've uh, ever been to Africa with uh, over the last 10 years. Uh, uh, before that, in 1989, when Sima and I had gone, we had uh, somebody else. And uh, by the way, Grant is a friend of Benson's. Yeah. <laughs> so because Grant, uh, yes, because Benson was part of uh, Wilderness Safaris mm -hmm. and Grant and Helena were also uh, part of Wilderness Safaris. 
So from the observation, uh, it's, not, it's, it's from the hilltop. It's not the observation hill. What is called the observation hill is in the uh, park proper. This is the Maasai Conservancy. You can see uh, elephants uh, going in uh, groups or families uh, like this. And I think this is one of Tibu's pictures, which with a 400 mm lens, it's really compressed the perspective uh, very nicely. And the brown uh, uh, area is the dry bed of Lake Amboseli. And one of the dramatic things is to see large groups of elephants in, in this area. Unfortunately, even in Amboseli, those herds don't exist anymore. The last of them, I think, were sighted in the uh, first decade uh, of the century. Uh, and, and Nick Brandt has some spectacular pictures of that. Um, here is a black and white version of the same uh, uh, where the herd has advanced a little bit further. And of course, uh, here is uh, uh, Kilimanjaro uh, with a female elephant and a little egret. Uh, the egrets always lend a beautiful touch uh, to the pictures. This uh, is one of my favorite And there's absolutely no snow anymore. Yes. Actually, it's, the snow has increased again, Barbara. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, so in the March trip, it looked like the snow had increased uh, a little. So I think there is hope uh, there. But I, I have to say that uh, when we saw the mountain in 2017, it was really dismaying to see a uh, very limited amount of uh, snow. And then you can see even in this picture, a limited amount of snow. The same elephant, but you can see that this is from a, I think this is one of Tibu's pictures, uh, really lying down on the ground uh, to get the dramatic perspective. Uh, yep. This is uh, uh, going down on the plains and uh, watching uh, these uh, herds uh, across different positions from one side and then moving on to the other side. Uh, uh, you could lie and wait for them and they'll uh, approach you and then uh, break to the side and, uh, and move off. I love this picture. I think this might be Tibu's showing uh, the giraffes uh, in the distance. Uh, it's almost like uh, they are leading uh, and following the elephants. Uh. Mm. So uh, again, another little portrait uh, showing this uh, unique pattern of uh, tears on the ears. Uh, and you can see the blood vessels, the veins uh, on the ears. And uh, with uh, with appropriate uh, you know, skill and observation, one can actually identify animals, uh, individual elephants by uh, the pattern of the ears and the veins. Of course, there are many other characteristics that can be used, but these are important. Uh, mm. Another uh, portrait there. Um, this is the same elephant uh, who was there in the picture uh, with the three of us lying on the ground. Uh, his name is Isau, and uh, we'll, we'll come to Isau later. It's an interesting character. Uh, okay. Egrets, uh, again, always making things uh, interesting. Uh, I think this is one of Tibu's, he managed to Capture that egret flying off. Uh, it's interesting to note that this is a very similar pose, but there are two different animals. Uh, uh, this is a uh, uh, wildebeest with a slightly different pigmentation. I think Grant called called it the golden wildebeest or something like that. Uh, it's a it's a slightly different species from the dark-skinned uh, uh, wildebeest that one sees uh, typically uh, in the Serengeti Mara ecosystem. The clouds uh, are, are dramatic, and I think the, the clouds make the picture. Uh, This is uh, perhaps my favorite picture of uh, 
that particular trip uh, it was uh, dark and stormy with uh, dark clouds on the horizon and there was just one little uh, break uh, in the clouds with a little corridor of light and uh, the elephant entered that and uh, we managed to take the the picture This is now uh, uh, interesting. This is uh, Cynthia Moss, Dr. Cynthia Moss. Uh, she's looking at the elephant book uh, that I had taken for her. Um, she uh, is, I think, 80 now and uh, went to Africa as a Newsweek reporter in the 60s. And uh, she went to uh, a place called Lake Manyara in uh, Tanzania, where there was a British uh, elephant researcher called Ian Douglas Hamilton. Uh, and found that elephants were far more interesting than uh, Newsweek and reporting. Uh, so she said that this is what I want to do. I want to uh, do elephant uh, observation and research. And uh, after uh, uh, looking around a little bit, she felt that Amboseli would be the place to go to because it was uh, one of the last uh, undisturbed uh, areas with, uh, with elephants. So she went to Amboseli in 1971 or 72, 71, I think. And she has been living in Amboseli continuously since then. Uh, obviously, you know, she, she travels and, and visits, but uh, she has done extraordinary work on uh, uh, behavior of elephants. Uh, she was actually responsible for elephants being declared uh, an endangered uh, species. And I think has made uh, more contribution to the conservation and science cause of elephants than uh, anybody else uh, alive at the moment. Um, so uh, I, I went and I met her and uh, spent a couple of hours uh, uh, chatting with her. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the work uh, that, uh, that she's done. Uh, uh, this, uh, the mug is interesting because uh, you can see the word echo. So echo the elephant is perhaps the most famous elephant uh, uh, and the most studied elephant in the world. So this is a, a, a book come a film that uh, Cynthia produced uh, with the BBC uh, uh, in, uh, I think 1991 or 1992. Uh, she initially saw Echo in 1972. Uh, and uh, Echo was part of uh, all the elephant groups that she was observing. She actually devised a nomenclature for the elephants, uh, uh, naming them uh, upon the, based upon how she christened the matriarch uh, from the first uh, letter of the alphabet. Uh, um, so this is, uh, uh, this is a foreword from uh, the book by David Rettenborough, and uh, he's uh, written how uh, Cynthia and Echo have known each other for 20 years. This is from 1991 and how uh, uh, she's watched uh, uh, and uh, gained behavioral insights from, from Echo and uh, other elephants, which are uh, really striking. In fact, she's the first one who observed that there is a matriarchal society amongst uh, uh, elephants and uh, you know, how as uh, the males grow, they leave the herds and so on. So this is um, from, uh, from the book. Uh, this is Echo, who was born in approximately 1945. And uh, uh, this family tree is as of uh, 1990. Uh, and the EB family is interesting because she started naming the families as A, B, C, and so on. And when she ran out, she went to uh, A, 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 B, and so on. And then finally, E, A, and E, B. So Echo's family is the E, B family. And uh, Echo was still alive at the time of uh, uh, the book being written and the film and eventually died of uh, uh, maybe natural causes in uh, 2009. Uh, so when there, there was a BBC producer uh, called Marion Zunz, Z-U-N-Z, who had wanted to make a film with Cynthia on elephants for a long time. And Cynthia never, she felt that the time just wasn't right. She didn't have enough insight. And in 1989, she felt that she knew enough about elephants that, we, that they could uh, have a film on one particular family. And the family they chose was uh, the uh, Echo family. 
and um, uh, it was really quite an amazing project and film and the book. And Marian unfortunately died in an accident before the film could be completed. But the film won uh, uh, several awards. So what I want to show here is uh, at, at the time this particular book was written. Uh, it was clear that Echo and Emily were sisters, but Ella, who was part of the same group, it was not clear whether Echo and Ella were sisters or Ella was Echo's daughter. But with subsequent work, including a different book, which I'm not citing and in which in fact we have, uh, 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 it was clear that Ella was Echo's daughter. And Isao, the, the bull that we saw in the pictures was born in December 1990 uh, after this particular project was uh, completed. Uh, the film was completed, but uh, not, not the book. So uh, Isao is uh, Echo's uh, grandson. And uh, this is from uh, the book showing you uh, Isao here with his older sister, Emma. And here is Isao when he's about four months old. Uh, playing around in the rain. And uh, this is Isao as of three months ago. So it was really quite remarkable to see this uh, uh, elephant, beautiful elephant uh, at uh, almost 30 years of age. And three years after we first encountered him in uh, 2017. Uh, so the interesting thing with Amboseli this time was that the wet season was much longer and much more severe than it had ever been. So most of the park was flooded, as you can see. The, these areas that you see with water are normally dry. And uh, so uh, moving around was very difficult. And uh, uh, some of the people who were planning to come perhaps to take photographs uh, had uh, actually canceled their trips because of that. This shows you how we were getting around. Uh, and uh, uh, this is the normal pathway that's, uh, that's slightly raised uh, with uh, planes on either side and everything is completely flooded and the road is basically washed off in places. Um, unfortunately, uh, I had uh, perfectly functioning uh, fancy cameras, but my Google Pixel camera stopped working. And so all the pictures that I had to take casually were all uh, selfies and you can see Kilimanjaro there in the distance. And you can see, Barbara, that the snow cap is much yeah, bigger yeah. than it was. This so that was very much. encouraging. Very. Uh, this, is, this picture is uh, to show, this is on top of the hill where we observe. And I wanted to show you how muddy everything uh, uh, had become. And also how I typically try to modify the vehicle. So the door has been taken off. And uh, the two seats that you see on the right side, the corresponding seats on the left side have been removed. So I would sit on this little mattress here with my feet dangling uh, on the side. And uh, behind me, uh, there is camera equipment uh, lying on this uh, little Maasai uh, blanket and covered by the Maasai blanket to protect it from uh, dust. So there is a, a, a very extreme ease in uh, popping out if uh, one had to and uh, uh, taking pictures uh, uh, from a slightly lower angle. In fact, uh, what, uh, uh, what Grant and I devised was also to use a monopod with a camera mounted at the end and using it uh, inverted with a um, uh, remote uh, trigger. You can see the wire of the remote and I would attach it to my Google Pixel and shoot the picture from a lower uh, level. So if the elephant is far enough and the ground is uh, reasonably dry, one could get out. But if the ground is completely muddy or the elephant is too close, then this was the only way to take uh, low angle pictures. So this, this shows you uh, uh, one of the, um, uh, this is actually not a matriarchal group because this guy, the big bull, uh, Pascal, uh, is following uh, one of the females uh, that is in estrus, and there are other uh, males and some females uh, hanging around. Uh, I just love the blue skies and the tall green grass, which was uh, off-putting to a lot of people because you, you sometimes can't see the entire elephant. But to me, it just added to the drama and the beauty of the pictures. Uh, uh, 
Uh, again, you can see here um, the, the green grass and the deep blue sky with egrets. A uh, number of different uh, bulls that we encountered. Uh, Uh, so this is an interesting uh, little clash uh, that we witnessed. Uh, when the two sets of tusks uh, strike each other, the noise is really quite striking. It's almost like a thunderclap. You can see the other elephant trying to clear out of the way. Uh, the most interesting thing, though, is that you typically see uh, uh, two young bulls fight each other. You will never see two big bulls, older uh, animals fight each other because you know there is no winning. There is just only uh, injuring each other. And... Um, you will uh, rarely see a uh, big bull fighting a younger bull because by the time the younger bull gets close enough, he'll know that uh, this is uh, really not my league and I don't want to fight. Uh, so elephant fights rarely turn out to be uh, very serious. <laughs> I like uh, uh, this picture with the egrets uh, sitting on the back of the elephant. Uh, that's uh, Isau in the distance with uh, uh, egrets landing on him. Uh, Isau again. This is Pascal. So there are at the moment two fairly dominant bulls uh, in the area. Uh, Pascal is one and Isau is the other. And what was fascinating what was what Cynthia Moss has talked about for many years that these animals have their own personalities. And we could see that despite both of them being in must, uh, when traditionally they tend to be bad tempered, Isao was really very calm and gentle. And uh, Pascal was, uh, was on edge and we could not go too close. Uh, that's Isao again with uh, a younger bull that was following him. Uh, that's Isao again uh, with his totally magnificent tusks. Uh, this was a, quite an amazing encounter with uh, Isao, where he let us uh, come reasonably close. And then we just parked and waited. And he kept on coming closer and closer. And uh, uh, at one point, when he looked straight at us, and I was in the back of the vehicle from the side taking pictures, the tip of the longer tusk was about one foot away from the front of the lens. Pascal. Pascal again. The Pascal's characteristic is this. Uh, he has got a right ear injury. And instead of uh, falling backwards, the right ear falls forwards. And uh, I like the egrets. Lots of egrets in this picture, including a flock of egrets flying. Isao again. Pascal. Isao. Isao again. And the last, I think, four or five pictures are uh, uh, my favorites uh, from this particular trip. Uh, uh, here you can see, this is Isao here, and he's greeting a younger bull. And uh, on the side, I like the interplay of the tusks. So the whole, uh, the whole uh, scene comes together uh, rather well. Uh, this is this is Pascal uh, in a sort of thoughtful mood. Uh, uh, Isao uh, again, and uh, this I think is actually this is the last photograph and uh, my favorite picture, uh, uh, sort of tableau of all these elephants uh, at uh, uh, sunset and uh, kind of almost leaves one wondering uh, uh, where things are going to be. You know, is the sun setting even on on elephants? Uh, Okay, I'm going to show the quick clips. So this one is from uh, uh, 2017. That's Sima. No, she has taken the picture, I mean. <laughs> the clip is Sima. <laughs> that is Isao. So you can see why she was nervous. <laughs> so 
So I have to say that if I Okay, so that is, that was clip number one. And uh, here is clip number two. This is going to be a little bit tricky to play. I think I'm going to go to, uh, you know, shall I, unfortunately this, uh, in this screen share mode, there is no way to make this. Uh, All right, we'll turn our heads. <laughs> yep, or the computer. So that is Richard Bonham's house. Richard Bonham's house is just gorgeous and he's got a big pool outside. And the elephants come to drink from his pool. This was that evening when we wanted to see one ton and we went careering across. He has a bunch of dogs. My perspective on the house is that any house where elephants come to visit like this has to be a gorgeous house. Has to be what? A gorgeous house. <laughs> <laughs> raising the dust. Uh... And the last one, which is actually, it's a short clip, uh, but shows you the, uh, again, taken by Seema. So those tusks, the smaller one probably weighs about uh, uh, 80 to 90 pounds and the bigger one probably about uh, 130, 140 pounds. You can see some of the still pictures within this clip. Okay. There we are. Oh, beautiful. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Jayesh. It's fabulous. It's great. Oh my. <laughs> do you, um, when you do your black and white, do you take the photograph in your black and white setting on the camera or do you process that later? No, I process them later. Yeah. The, uh, um, I shoot raw 
and then I convert them uh, uh, using uh, uh, one of the Photoshop or Adobe Bridge uh, plugins. I just, just in the beginning, what kind of camera and lenses do you use? So the, these days it's a Canon 1DX uh, and uh, some of the pictures are also shot on a Canon 1D Mark IV, okay. uh, 5DSR and some of the March uh, pictures, this year's pictures are on a Fujifilm GFX 100. And the lenses are uh, I use are from 16 to 35 zoom, 2470 zoom, 7200 and a fixed 200, fixed 400. And uh, Tibu uh, uses a 200 to 400 uh, Canon uh, zoom. That lens is just too big and heavy for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How I feel. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. That, that that lens weighs 12 pounds. I oh, no. <laughs> yeah, yes. would you talk a little bit about how much time is spent when you're not shooting looking for that right shot? Um, as I think as much time as uh, needed. And I think uh, the fact that Sima is so indulgent uh, obviously helps. So we, what we try and... Uh, we, we try you know, look at the light very carefully, uh, the physical features, and then try and go close to the animal uh, and try and imagine uh, what the picture will look like uh, and get in the right position. And once in the right position, try and wait uh, as long as possible uh, to try and, uh, try and get the uh, right, uh, right photograph. In fact, I'm gonna let uh, Seema talk uh, about a certain day uh, in a different place. It was the last day, and we had this lovely plunge pool in our little uh, very, very villa. This was in uh, Grumeti, uh, which is in the western part of uh, uh, Serengeti. Yeah. yeah, the Serengeti Plains. And uh, you had to give, um, you know, you had to plan in advance to have the plunge pool filled. And I, you know, this particular place also had uh, Wi Fi, so I was going to FaceTime family. And <laughs> anyway, we left early in the morning. And uh, these guys spotted a pair of cheetah brothers that were sleeping. And this, you know, left early in the morning, wake up at four and you're out by five because God forbid you miss one little piece of light, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and we were there till 8 p.m. at night. Yeah. 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 Waiting for them to wake up and to get the right <laughs> shot. And they would wake up, stretch, go back to sleep. And our meals were just delivered. <laughs> to the you know the other vehicle brought the meals and I remember I was pouring uh, some us uh, some tea or coffee or something and suddenly the cheetahs got up and we had to pour the drinks out so we could start <laughs> moving and you know so it's a it's just a whole day thing it just depends on what you see so I think when you saw that hyena um, uh, chase the baby elephant that dramatic uh, uh, chase. Uh, uh, it was three hours, and you just keep going until the light disappears. So the interesting thing with Grumeti is that this was March of uh, 2015, I think. Uh, it's not an area where people go uh, until June, but uh, it's a beautiful uh, lodge, the Sasakwa Lodge on a, on a cliff, and Sima wanted to see it. So we went there, and that year, the migration took place much earlier than normal. And when we spotted the cheetahs, Grant Atkinson, looking at their belly, said that these guys have not eaten for at least for a couple of days. So they are bound to get up and uh, hunt uh, today. And in fact, we, they, when they did get up, uh, when Seema was about to pour out pour her tea, we followed them uh, a run behind the wildebeest and zebras. Unfortunately, we did not see a successful hunt, but we saw plenty of stalking and chases. So the... the the, the observation, the, the thrill, and the photographs were just totally, totally incredible. Absolutely worth it. Uh, uh, plunge will be damned. <laughs> Jayesh, can, can you say something about what it was like to be in front of those amazing beasts? Mm. It is, it's, it's uh, humbling. And I think uh, it brings, uh, brings emotions that are, that one, cannot imagine having for animals of, of this sort. And uh, particularly with uh, Isao, knowing the entire story of, of his birth and having seen him three years earlier and then seeing him again and having uh, 
uh, you know, knowing Cynthia Moss and having talked to her, it, it was just uh, truly, truly special. One of the things that I, I did not point out in that family tree was uh, uh, um, one of the one of the nephews of uh, Echo was a baby called Eli, and Eli was born with uh, crossed and deformed feet, uh, something that would typically be fatal because the uh, the uh, baby would not be able to walk enough, and the entire family, the Echo group, took care of Eli over a period of two to three years. And uh, yes. he is a perfectly healthy adult uh, now. And mm -hmm. he is subject of a book and a film. I think it's called uh, Little Big Years. Uh, I, I, so so then, I, think, I think seeing elephants is really the closest to observing, uh, you know, gentle and magnificent human beings. It's, it's a feeling that you cannot uh, describe. It has to be experienced. And I'm sure Barbara will say the same. What I've always found, even though I know they are so endangered, the minute I'm in pr the presence of an elephant, I feel safe. I feel that everything is right with the world, even though intellectually I know it's not. But there is something so incredible with them and usually first nights out there which I've described as absolutely psychotic because you're hearing sounds and you're adjusting to the bush and you hear the twigs break and you know there's an elephant out there and you know I usually burst into tears not being an emotional person <laughs> at all but um I've been so lucky with them and it does take patience. And I, I'm fascinated with the people who do the 15 minute click. I've seen an elephant. Benson and I spend six, eight hours with specific um, elephants or cheetahs or whatever you, to really enjoy you need patience. And if you're photographing, oh my God, do you need patience? Uh, last trip, and I'll send a clip of that, we encountered an incredible herd of elephants. And Benson got out of the car, as did our guide, which can't be shown because both of them would have gotten fired. But by the time the elephants came in front of us, Benson and Mark were under the car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a safe place to be if you are uh, um, outside and the elephants come close. Well, it's, it's psychologically safe because uh, for uh, somebody, an animal like uh, Isau or Pascal to flip uh, uh, the Land Cruiser would be nothing. I know. And, and I've been lucky enough, as you have, with our guides, that they can read the elephants, and especially, especially with the males, you can get out of the car and be on your belly. Or, I mean, Benson has walked me through a herd of Cape Buffalo. <laughs> You know, they're just looking at me, but they're not interested. And when you trust your guides so completely, you go, am I really walking through here to Cape <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I think trusting the guide uh, and the guide's judgment yeah. is uh, really the single most important uh, thing. Uh, um, with, with Grant, I learned it on my first trip to Botswana in 2011, uh, when we were trying to photograph uh, a pride of lions and everybody was doing one thing and Grant said, well, why don't we drive here? I said, well, we are going in the wrong direction. He said, listen, just, just, just hang on. And sure enough, uh, it was five minutes before the lions came walking towards us and we had managed to find a depression and we had uh, parked a uh, 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 Land Rover in there. Uh, so we were at eye level with the uh, with the uh, lions, 
You've got an amazing to picture of a lioness. You've got to go to Zimbabwe. I mean, they still have the huge tuskers and they're wild elephants. So I think Zimbabwe is perhaps the one of the next uh, couple of trips. Uh, uh, Shiloh Gorge with uh, Clive yep. and uh, Pamushana. Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, but Sherry? Sherry? Talk about one posture and shorter than the other. Is that like they're right handed or left handed? Yes, right tusked or left tusked. So they use one tusk uh, preferentially and that results in, so you saw um, uh, uh, Isao is lefty and um, one ton is righty. Uh, interestingly, there was no such asymmetry with uh, Pascal. Maybe, maybe he's uh, uh, ambidextrous. Uh, <laughs> or, or he lets others do the work. <laughs> It, it, it's, I, I know a few of you are familiar with the documentary makers, Derek and Beverly Joubert with Great Plains. And something popped up on my computer last week where there's a lot of poaching and the rangers aren't getting paid. So it's an opportunity to help fund rangers and get them out in the field. So I'll post that. Because um, anything we can do to help, I mean, it is so totally on the edge. And, you know, we can't save it all, but we can do a little bit now. Yeah, the um, uh, you know one would think that the pandemic, with uh, decrease in the tourism, is is good for wildlife and the environment, which is in some sense true. But in the other sense, if the uh, local economy is not being stimulated by tourism, that's when people are going to turn to uh, bushmeat. Bushmeat. And uh, even if they don't want to necessarily uh, kill uh, um, uh, the, the the better wildlife, if you will. They are going to interact with uh, with gorillas and with with elephants and with lions, and, and they'll end up killing. So, in fact, the uh, what was it about four weeks ago? Uh, one of the most famous silverbacks was killed exactly. because the poacher didn't the, the the guy didn't go to kill the silverback. He went to get bush meat and uh, came into contact with the silverback and ended up uh, killing him. So, I mean, these are the consequences of uh, of what's happening at the moment. You know, and until we're able to help communities understand, and you can't during a pandemic, but to understand the wildlife is bringing them uh, positive things with employment, with tourism, with all sorts of positive Elephants, you know, walk in and destroy fields. You have that a lot in India. Yes. But, you know. You know to me, uh, you know, looking at people like uh, uh, Jane Goodall and, and Cynthia Moss, uh, the, the difference that they have made to uh, these individual threatened species and have really effectively devoted their whole lives to right. lives. It's 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 uh, humbling and uh, it was just amazing to to meet people like that and and talk to them about their passion. So when she was looking at the book of photographs, she'd uh, look at uh, the uh, individual animals and point out uh, their names. And, oh, this is this one. This is that one. Oh, this is one ton. He never comes here to the Amboseli area, you know. But it was interesting with Pamushana. A few years ago, you know, I was out of the car with the elephants and Benson and Mark and the guide. And there had been a report that the elephant we were looking at had been injured in a fight. 
And I'm thinking, why am I out of the car with an injured elephant? <laughs> you know, but again, I trusted everybody. You could hear the wheezing. And Benson looked at the situation and decided he didn't like it and that he thought Mark was taking too much of a risk. And we backed up and I got in the hunting car. I got pictures. That was no tusk. That elephant had been shot. And nobody was saying it, but through Benson's contacts, he ran into a ranger he knew because the elephant did die and was found in a pan and it was, had been shot. But nobody, for whatever the political reasons were, um, was admitting to it. Yeah, to the, to, to the question of the emotion, when you, when you are close to elephants, it's impossible to fathom how anybody could shoot uh, uh, such a creature for, for tusks or, or whatever. It's, it's just, it's unimaginable. Isn't, isn't it about empathy? If you don't have empathy for your fellow human beings, how are you for an elephant? That is true. <laughs> how about the King of Spain? Oh my yeah. God. Life. What, what did he do now? He went oh, he and he fell off the, he fell and he broke his leg. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? I don't, he, I don't know. He fell and he broke his leg, but he, but he was, he was taken out of the world wildlife, whatever it was. What was that, Jayesh? It was, he was uh, supposed to be on the board of the worldwide fund. And uh, I think he went hunting to Zimbabwe or I, I forget one of the places okay. where they still allowed it in a limited fashion. Yeah. But uh, it's not the sort of thing that one would do uh, at all. I think this was about two or three years ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I went on a fantastic elephant back safari in Botswana in uh, 1997, I think it was. And we rode out on elephants in the morning and in the afternoon. And so we were completely part of nature. It was incredible. Yeah, there is, I, uh, I, I, I don't know the name of the camp that uh, does it. I think there's one camp that still it does was, it. It was Abu. Abu. Yes, that's right, Abu. And it's totally frowned upon. I think it's been discontinued. Uh, no, it is, yeah. We didn't realize it was to be frowned no, upon. And, you know, we rode elephants in India. There, there are all sorts of walking with tigers in Myanmar. Uh, it's uh, what the Brits would say, it's just not done. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yes. As we've discovered more about our interactions with an animals. Yeah, they seemed very happy though. They seemed to enjoy themselves and we didn't think that it was cruel in any way. But no, I wouldn't do it again, I suppose. Well, we're all hopefully becoming more sensitive as the research comes out. My wife, um, Jerry, sends her regrets that she couldn't be here today. Um, but she did a series called Walking with the Elephants. Um, oh. I will send a picture to, to the group. Oh, wonderful. Uh, and it was uh, part of a, um, it was in Kerala. Okay. And, and these were not wild elephants. These were temple, temple elephants, elephants, which is a whole different story. Um, of um, confinement, I guess is the best way to, to, to phrase it. But, um, but standing in front of those amazing uh, creatures, it, it is humbling. And you also, I found that it was, I felt these are prehistoric creatures. I felt part of like the continuum of history and prehistory, you know, even just, just visualizing the, the skin, you know, and the, the feel of the skin and the folds, it just seems to represent time. Yes, absolutely so, right. You know, so to be able to be there in, in Africa, where it's a, a more open environment, must just be stunning. So, and beautiful photographs. Thank you. They were amazing, Jesh. Thank you. Yes. It's a pleasure. Yeah, Jesh, I don't know whether you're a better photographer or a better doctor. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> that's a that's a double edged compliment if i ever heard one I have not, but I, I think I probably should uh, do something. Uh, I've got to get scale, it. scale is everything, you know. It'd be nice to see some of these really big. Some of them are so beautiful. Um, oh my God! Uh, linger, you, you. I, I wanted to linger on the photo. Right. The qualities were very painterly, and um, and I, yeah, I would, I would love to see them in my new house. And I some would, of them are actually they are pictures that you can easily blow up to uh, uh, four feet by six feet or even larger than that. Uh, we shot raw in the Himalayas last year for the first time. You might want to say something about raw. It's so dense and big and huge files yes. that you have so much artistic control right. afterward to yes. create the effect. It's it's a new and it's strange because you think normally cameras are getting smaller and more efficient, and then along comes raw, and they're not small and they're not. But the quality of the material is so high that you can really do artistic things. So when I saw some of these things, I mean, they just, to me, really begged to be seen somewhere um, in some fashion. They were really beautiful. Because what I, I, I love did. about your pictures is the scale, that you've got this huge animal that's so tiny in its environment. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're stunning, stunning pictures. Jayesh, there's a site they have in Northwestern, I think, medical doctors who, who are involved in art. Did you know about that? There are some doctors who submit their pictures. They go through all the hospital systems. Interesting. No, I didn't. <laughs> I did not know that. <laughs> there are some. Some do painting, some do photography. I'm sure they would love to know of your work. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll check it out. So I have a... Um, uh, Seema and I have published uh, a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine, but I have published two photographs in the New England Journal of Medicine. <laughs> and, uh, so they, they uh, in some of the white space, they used to use uh, filler pictures. Mm. And on one of the Botswana trips, we uh, saw a lioness, uh, two lionesses cooperatively hunting. And uh, uh, an impala jumped, the lioness jumped and she missed the impala. And what I found subsequently was that she had a left-sided uh, corneal opacity. So she was effectively blind in one eye and therefore had no depth perception. So I sent both the pictures to the New England Journal of Medicine saying, listen, these two are sort of uh, interesting pictures and they are, they are, uh, there's, a, there's a physiological explanation and uh, they do belong in the NEGM. So they said, uh, yes, we published them both. But we can't publish them in the same issue, side by side. They need to be big enough. So they came in two separate issues. <laughs> I'm surprised you didn't operate on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> OK, we've got some interesting people coming up. I, because I love Silk Road and I love textiles, Shoma's going to do a preview of one of her presentations. We have um, Alexander imitating, not imitating, interviewing his mother. <laughs> and she was a great, well, she still is textile collector who took off for Afghanistan in 72 and brought back the most amazing pieces, some of which wound up at the V&A. And I was lucky enough to be at her house and it's a treasure trove, you know, rooms filled with material. And every piece tells a story. So he's gonna interview his nice. mom. And moving forward, I mean, all of you are so goddamn interesting. It's a joy. <laughs> Well, you brought us all together. Well, yes. and I was selective because I have friends who wouldn't be interested in any of this, but all of you are. And I've loved watching you come together and enjoy one another. I think we're all intellectual omnivores. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's that omnivorousness <laughs> okay. that links us that, you know, 
That's right. It's hard to imagine something. I'm just, I'm just curious. We wouldn't be interested in learning about. Hmm? I'm just curious, Penelope. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Well, that's another way of saying the same thing, I think. You know, <laughs> but curiosity is an addiction too. Really? <laughs> it is. Learning, learning is what you become addicted to. <laughs> and, and as a kid, I used to read the world book. Me too. And I never knew. You know, I never knew which copy and would find the most fascinating things. You can imagine what I'm like on the internet, you know, going, oh, I can go here, <laughs> go here, oh, let me go that way. Actually, See? Barbara, I, I know how you are because you put, you share some of that stuff with me and I'm sure everyone else here. If I may just but, um, break, a, change the subject slightly because I know we're all, so very grateful to Barbara for putting us together with these wonderful salon presentations. I think it's fitting to tell everybody that this Thursday is Barbara's birthday and oh. we might want to sing in a band <laughs> right now. So if we could, one, two, three. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. To you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Well, for you opera aficionados, fired. <laughs> there's some potential there, as all. <laughs> We're going to take the show I'll on the road, no question. I'll take the fifth on that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jack, is, is there anything new or interesting we should be knowing about? About what oh, the hour has been canceled? About our current pandemic. Say that again, I'm sorry. Is yes, there the president wore a mask today. Oh, yes. <laughs> is there anything new coming out that we should be aware of? I mean, I have found a very happy existence in my lovely cave here. <laughs> and rarely, you know, now that I've adjusted to it all emotionally, I just want to live. And you know, uh, Jayish, are, um, how are things at Northwestern? Are you uh, all back to normal when it comes to your outpatient clinics and that sort of thing or? So I think in oncology for Seema and me and uh, everybody else in oncology, there was a period that was a little lean intentionally uh, for safety, but uh, we are, I think, uh, going back to capacity because, you know, cancer doesn't wait. And uh, as far as the non-cancer, more routine stuff is concerned, I think they are still ramping up uh, gradually. Uh, 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 for some things, there is a hesitation on part of patients because they are worried and uh, for some days I have hesitation on part of the physicians. But I will tell you, precautions, ma uh, masks, hand washing, mm -hmm. all those things absolutely do work because uh, in hematology, oncology, uh, on the inpatient and the outpatient side, we've not had a single healthcare acquired uh, COVID infection amongst patients or amongst healthcare workers. So if you take uh, appropriate precautions, uh, you know, things can be safe. Congratulations. And, and I'm, uh, I don't know, you don't know me, but I'm an, I'm, I'm used to be a doctor, I guess I am. You're quite a doctor. Chief of staff, where? Following <laughs> this quite closely. Uh, to answer your question, Barbara, from my standpoint, from reading the literature this week, the WHO uh, pronouncements on the airborne infections, a little bit disturbing. I haven't seen the, the, the original papers. I mean, so one, oh, as, as, as uh, Seema and Jayesh will always tell you, sometimes they're reported in such a way, when you look at the actual papers, uh, it's not quite what they're saying or their methodology isn't so terrific and on and on and on. I don't have to go into the boring details. However, that would suggest that this opening up of places like restaurants for indoor, indoor dining uh, without having a, a, a ventilation system, especially in this hot weather with air conditioning and all, all going on, may not be as safe as they're trying to make it out. 
And actually, as I pointed out, I don't know, I gave a little talk. There was a paper that came out of China which showed the pattern of infection in, in, in a restaurant there, mm -hmm. which was very suggestive. This was months ago of actually aerosolized mm -hmm. uh, infection spread from one table to mm -hmm. another because they were much further than, than a meter or two meters away. Mm -hmm. And yeah. even with the air currents coming back, a table that was in the opposite end of the room uh, was also affected yeah. by this. The problem we have though with these asymptomatic um, uh, yes. infections or people not actually manifesting illness very early in the course, we don't know if they actually enter the, the restaurant already sick. And, and because we're not actually looking, I mean, at least the papers I read, at the DNA sequences of these infections and therefore saying it's the same virus. That is the same virus infecting A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. So without actually being able to do this in a way, we can't actually pinpoint whether or not these people are getting infected before they walked into the restaurant or during the meal. So it's not so easy, but it is a little cautioning. And the other thing is, of course, with opening up of schools. Oh, I mean, to have all of these children in, in rooms, even if they're sitting apart from one another for hours on end, even with masks on, and God knows you're gonna to have to go by and make sure those masks fit properly and they don't pull them off over their noses. This is gonna be a nightmare. It's gonna be an absolute nightmare. Anyway, and teachers so, are terrified. Well, some yeah. of them, there was, a, again, a news report about three teachers, three teachers. who were teaching summer school, all Co three of them came down with it and one died. And, and, uh, serving all the, and they were masked and gloved masked and everything and, else. So it's yeah. very scary. Uh, I don't know if you wanna uh, jump in on this, uh, the doctors uh, to my right on my screen, but that's the only, as far as a vaccine goes or effective treatment to prevent us, not you know people who are sick in the hospital, but uh, therapy for us, um, to prevent us from getting sick should we get exposed or something like that. I don't see that's there yet. Uh, I, I agree. So the interesting thing is that Seema and I were both, uh, we continue to work full time uh, with all the appropriate precautions and we are both antibody negative. And that tells you that uh, casual exposure is not going to cut it. You either need a proper vaccine or you need an illness from which you uh, recover. Yes. Yes. Didn't hear. What did you say? We couldn't no, I, hear you. Uh, I said that we've been in, you know, both of us traveled. Uh, I went to India. Jaish was in uh, Africa in March, and we passed through several airports, uh, came back. And while we were there, we were in contact with lots of people. This was the first week of March. And since we got back, we've been seeing patients in clinic. Uh, and uh, we recently had our antibody tests, and we are still negative, meaning that. Despite all the contact we had, we don't have uh, immunity. immunity. Yeah, many of us were still traveling by mid-March. I mean, Michael and I came back from New York City, which was, shall we say, an epicenter, uh, <laughs> and uh, in um, on March 17th, and of course quarantine ourselves for two weeks, and we were, and we were, we were fine. But we, but we were, I, you know, in some ways, a an airplane, given the kind of circulation of air that's on it. Uh, if everyone is masked and properly behaving themselves, which um, may not be that dangerous an environment, considering how, how the, they have HIPAA filters. filters and they have the way the air circulates there with the air exchanges going on constantly with outside air. They're not as dangerous as we, we all once have feared. Now, I'm not jumping on a plane and going anywhere because where's there to go? I mean, the yeah. other thing is, is but... Uh, um, I'm, I'm less, given what we're learning about this, I'm less concerned about how uh, a dangerous air, air flight might be because of the way the, the precautions they're taking. And, uh, but as they say, there's nowhere to go. I mean, even if you, first of all, we can't go to Europe, they're not letting us in. India, I don't think they're issuing visas there's for- There's two weeks, two, weeks uh, two weeks of quarantine. Uh, so even so, if you do land up, you have yeah. to- yeah, so I, I don't know where there's to go right now, but uh, I'm not going anywhere until I, I feel safe with the vaccine anyway. What mm -hmm. I found interesting was that article that I sent to you, Jack, about 
seniors who were saying to hell with it, you know, we're going to live until we die. And all I think about is how hideous this illness is once you catch it and you, the brain, every system failing and it's not pretty. So no, actually, why, are you, why are you gonna live until you die and take risks? Than that actually, and this is the thing that I brought up before. Yes, but you did. Get sick and if you're one of these people who go into rapid respiratory failure and you wind up on breathing or a ventilator or whatever, you're knocked out. When you pass away, you're not, you're, you're not awake. However, you may be unlucky enough to, to actually get through this disease with terrible residual effects. Absolutely. And if you think that's going to be fun to live with, you're wrong. And these people are crazy. Yeah. But you know what you said about flying, what I've read is that the actual filtration systems, air circulation systems of the planes are quite excellent. That's right. In you know, shifting the air and filtering it. And airlines like Southwest are having center seats open. So far, so good. I spoke a couple of days ago with a friend of mine who's a physician in um, St. Louis, and she had to fly with her son to New Haven to retrieve his, his stuff because New Haven had sent people off for spring vacation and then said, don't come back. So they were left with stranded. And she said, you know, the person across from her felt that whenever she talked, she should lower her mask. Oh. And so did that. <laughs> the person who was on oh, the window God. side um, wanted, wanted to sleep and he took his mask off to sleep. So I think your assumption that people are behaving themselves is optimistic. I and the airline specifically saying they are not enforcing this. Right. Because people go ballistic. You, you, we've seen people go ballistic on land at a Costco when yeah. asked to wear a mask. You really don't want to have that happen at 30,000 feet. So they are not enforcing it. So I, 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 I wouldn't trust to the um, intelligence and kindness of your seat. No, not at all. Uh, you know, Blanche Dubois had it wrong. <laughs> there was a very interesting article, I think, yesterday or today on New York Times about the doctor who had committed suicide, Dr. Green. And there was a very emotionally charged article, but what was they said alluded to, I'd be very interested to know what the physicians think, that there might be a psychological effect on the physicians that they, are, they haven't studied yet, whether <laughs> the brain somehow this constant pressure and the constant stress from COVID. I think that did you see that in the article Merle something yeah. that was a very really interesting side thing that they yeah. have started yeah. that. I'm it's clear that they'll have PTSD. You cannot oh my God you yes not work in that environment and with those outcomes and seeing what's going on without it. I've always admired oncologists uh, as well. I'm not trying to but I'm just saying to you you have to, you have these psycholog psychological adaptations. As a geriatrician, this is what I used to do. It's different. Your job is slightly, not that you aren't a physician in trying to relieve suffering, but in the end, everyone passes away. And, and so you have a different point of trying to help people transition to that, to that individual, but also to make sure that they're functionally kept at a certain level as best you can for the time, for the time they have. But you, these doctors who are working in the ICU in the worst of situations or the emergency rooms when they're overwhelmed, they have to be suffering post some uh, post traumatic stress disorder. They've got to be, because there are many people who who are working in less situations where where they suffer from this. So I I believe that, and I'm not saying that uh, it, that. She, I didn't read the article, but when, when this happened, I'm sure there are other factors involved in their own internal makeup. But as, as practicing doctors over time, you develop up defense mechanisms against what you see and what you have to deal with. Oncology being a hard one. The other area that I couldn't possibly deal with was pediatrics. When yes, I was I a medical student or pediatric oncology for that matter. But that's, I think that's the worst of the lot. But 
Well, you know, the other thing is I, when I was a, um, a medical student uh, in 1968, I uh, had my uh, rotation is in pediatrics and uh, the head of the department happened to be a pediatric hematologist. In those days, they had no effective treatment for childhood leukemia and it was a terrible, terrible thing to see and to go through. So anyway, I don't want to, that's ancient history and thank God things have gotten better. Yeah, yeah. What I've found interesting, and I keep sending these articles or videos to Jack, there's one by the Lincoln Project, and I don't know what the other one was. They keep referring to people Jackson my age as the greatest generation who fought World War II. And I'm going... I'm in Korea, but that's why... Quite- <laughs> you know, I was born in 42. My dad was the greatest generation. Well, you can't, you know, the but, history is so screwed up. <laughs> but anyway, for Lincoln Project, I'm a, a contributor. I don't want to get into the deep, deep politics, but I enjoy those people very much. Oh, and, yes. And uh, I am on there. You should uh, go on there. Uh, they have a Zoom. Okay, they, they send this out okay. to the supply. So make a contribution. It doesn't have to be used. $25, you'll be, you'll be invited to their Zoom meetings and uh, they're fascinating. They're, and the little clips are fabulous, absolutely. Absolutely. Wonderful, wonderful. They're really wonderful. And um, they've been asked, you know, there of course, there was an article in the Wall Street, was it the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post? Wall Street Journal today or yesterday about them. They're, they're trying to figure out whether these never Republican groups are, or never Trump Republicans or the Lincoln people are actually gonna have an impact on uh, the election. And I have no idea because they, they don't, they're preaching to the choir when it's coming. When it's us, right. It's us. So they, um, they're very serious about it and they're actually quite clever. I mean, they, and, and they're needling him, okay? I mean, they do, they do post, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, commercials, ads during the time they know he's watching television. Yes, <laughs> I think it is aimed. It's really aimed at decompensating him. That's correct. So he sort of commits uh, harakiri, right. then to get uh, uh, other people to change their minds. But they are they are very much focused on uh, specific races. They're very much focused on specific, uh, um, you know, uh, states. We're not going to see a lot of their ads in Chicago because obviously we right. don't need to. But uh, they've raised about twenty million dollars. Now, the Trump people say, you know, that's pennies, pennies. What, what, what can they do with twenty million dollars? It's they can do a lot, and they're very intelligent. They're very, these are, after all, political strategists who's worked for other. Republican presidential runs, successful ones, and uh, and what they say makes a lot of sense. Their focus, this this one, is to defeat him and maybe Lindsey Graham or one or two others. They have a hit list. They have made a decision that over the next two, three, four election cycles, they are going to target the leaders of the House and Senate who enabled him to do the evil things that he's done and get away with them. And so, uh, who knows? In the meantime, as I say, I've been sending the money, not, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, but, you know, in, but something. In the, in the liberal television media, because these ads are so clever, and obviously the liberal television media is very sympathetic they're getting all kinds of free airtime. I mean, whatever $20 million they raise that they can make ad buys, in addition, I bet you they've had almost an equivalent amount of free airtime. Well, I'm great. <laughs> well, there, I've, I've seen a discussion raised for the first time of whether the Republican Party might dump Trump. You know, people like Mitt Romney have come out adamantly against uh, particularly his his co- co- commuting of the sentence of oh. Roger Stone, oh. which, which crossed a line. But the, the point was made that those 
in the legislature, Senate and the House, are beginning to realize that, that being associated with Trump is not an asset in their campaigns. And what the hell do they do? They, they, can't, they can't really um, go against him. On the other hand, if they support him, when so much of the country is increasingly against him, uh, that may be dangerous. So, you know, I, it, it, we have some interesting times ahead of us. There's also the possibility that's been raised that he will not run because he can't stand to lose. So we'll see. But uh, one thing I wanted to say back on the COVID issue, or the, it, it does not begin to reach the level us that's on the front lines are experiencing. Not at all, but I, all of us are experiencing an ongoing level of anxiety that can't can't be without some repercussions. Of course. You know, we have the fear of a disease that's unknown, terrible. We have the economic fallout. We have this incredible political morass. And there's no place really to be safe. And I, I don't think it's just us. I, I watch much of the country, and I don't know what we have. But Penelope, if we get very existential, which my mother was, are we ever safe? This is just highlighting the dangers in a very dramatic way that exists for us and pertains to us. But, but part of safety is how you feel. Right. Whether the act, whether the fact is that you are never safe, which is probably the accurate thing. There are certainly have been times when we have felt safe. I don't think we feel safe now and that that makes all the difference. I hear what you're saying about the, it's, you're never safe. And that's true. But I'm not going to a restaurant. I'm very happy in my house. We're all very self-sufficient. Some of you have to go out of your house and be the brilliant doctors you are. I see me. It's awesome. But we're very careful. Very. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, went, I, went to, I went to a grocery store for the first time last Friday after the happy. first week of March. I went to Trader Joe's because there is no delivery from Trader Joe's. Which one did you go to? Uh, Trader Joe's. No, which one? Which Trader? Oh, oh. the one on Huron. You know, I, I'm going to give you a secret. The one in Hyde Park, because we don't live in Hyde Park, we live in this neighborhood too, is a beautiful big store, huge, with huge uh, aisles. And it's uh, a much safer feeling and much less constricted. They do a good job, but it's, it's a, and uh, it's not, given that they're, you're, you're at Northwestern, you could hop on Lakeshore Drive and be down there in 15 minutes because right. the traffic is non-existent right now. But yeah. I'm just, I throw, I'm throwing this out for you. Good point. Yeah. yeah. You want to go to the park? In that what? parking lot? Yes. There's a small bakery called Bonjour Bakery. Please go there. <laughs> <laughs> it's if you, divine. It's very, very good. Uh, and it's owned by French people. And uh, it's the authentic stuff. It's awesome. they, and they have a really nice little restaurant, restaurant in Hyde Park as well. They used to, I think it was owned by the parents of friends of Tommy's when she was at lab. And if I remember. Yes. Right, they were lab parents, 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 yes. yes. They had ginger scones. They were gorgeous. You know, when David and I would go pick Tommy up, you know, that was a stop. <laughs> <laughs> we go there during Thanksgiving to pick up the apple pies from there and the peach oh. tarts. It's fantastic. They're a fabulous bakery. We should remember that. Yeah. Yeah, after the boys uh, graduated, we haven't really frequented those shops. Otherwise, you know, that we had our little pit stops, we'd pick up a few things. And... I've shopped at Senior Hour, which for a night owl is a real sacrifice. <laughs> <laughs> at Trader Joe's. And I, I, I came, the last time I was there, there was no one in the parking lot. 
no one in the store. This is the one on Ontario. And the secret they said was it was raining. And senior hour when it's raining, there is nobody there. Nobody. <laughs> and they're quite even the one on Ontario. Yep. That's the one my kids go to. But, you know, in a positive, as scared as they are, I am extremely impressed with my whole family and the decisions they're making and the cautions they're taking and, you know, their respect for taking care of me, you know, by being distant, which isn't fun, but it's a reality. And um, I've been impressed with all their decision making. I mean, it was interesting, and Jack saw this too. I think it was one of the articles. He's my personal fact checker. Uh, <laughs> ethically, I love having him. That there, you know, these COVID parties, the 30s are giving and one guy caught it and died and he says i guess i made a bad mistake decision really <laughs> joe Tittle. fox news has a lot to answer for yes i think there are an awful lot of people sh who should be up if for crimes against humanity but we're not going to see the world court do that <laughs> But explain to me the psychologically astute in this group. How do Kellyanne and George stay married? <laughs> I think I think they are doing this for the sake of their kids. I think this whole thing is an act. They're hedging their bets. You know? <laughs> what else can it be? You know? It's just insane. I don't know what it is, but whatever it is, it is the deepest secret to a happy marriage. <laughs> and if they can bottle it up, they can get very rich. I'm afraid Michael and I have to go. But, and yeah. it was lovely. Uh, thank, thank you, thank you. Everyone. And thank you for the musical salute. Love you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thanks, Barbara. Bye. Thank you.